Calloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Calloway. It wasn't the day of the jackal, it was the day of the premature ejaculation, an orgiastic fervor of jerks all over the world, but particularly in the English-speaking world. One after another, these journalists, analysts, and politicians, some of them superannuated, lined up to leap over the cliff lemming-like with their absolutely catastrophically wrong takes on what was happening in Russia. Not that it's put them off. The Sunday papers were as if Saturday night had never even happened. And the head of Wagner, who went from being the leader of rapist murdering scum on the FBI terrorist list, then spent a glorious few hours as a freedom fighter is back on the terrorist list and, from what I hear, sleeping on a bench in Minsk. You think I'm joking? We've got the exclusive picture. Coming up, fasten your seatbelts. It's the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Galloway, the mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. John Simpson thought he was going to liberate Moscow like he earlier liberated Kabul. Andrew Neil, all these eggheads. What's her name? The one that's in the uh, Atlantic who's married to the Polish former minister who thanked the United States for blowing up the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline before later seeking to delete it, forgetting that the internet is forever. She said that it was Putin's Tsar Alexander II moment. One by one, they said that this was the end for the Russian president and they waxed lyrical about how it needed to be the end of Russia itself. Their glee was a trifle difficult to understand because the next president of Russia, according to them, was going to be a former chef who spent nine years in jail as a thief and who had always been described, ever since Wagner came to public consciousness, as the head of a fighting organization of rapists and murderers, the scum, the sweepings of the Russian jailhouses, given uh, free pardon for their crimes if they served their time in uniform in Wagner. In other words, a terrorist, and that's how he was except for a few hours yesterday, officially designated. So, as Russia has more nuclear weapons than any country on the globe, they were gleefully looking forward to a former convict turned chef and now mercenary warlord being in charge of the world's largest nuclear arsenal. It's rather difficult to understand how for anybody that would have been a step forward, but such is their hatred of Putin since he lifted Russia up off the floor, dusted it down, turned it back into a superpower with economic, political, diplomatic and military power to match that they were looking forward to Prigozhin being the next president of Russia. I'm not making it up. The fact that the principal criticism of Wagner towards President Putin and the current leadership of the Ministry of Defense in Moscow is that they are not killing enough Ukrainians, that they are not bombing enough, rocketing enough, advancing hard enough, that they have not turned 
Ukraine into a desert of rubble, that they have not leveled the cities of Western Ukraine, that they have not destroyed the civilian infrastructure of Ukraine. That's their beef with Putin, that he has been too soft, too cautious, too kid gloves. Again, I ask, how would that have been an advance for the Ukrainian people and their backers if Prigozhin had taken power in the state? Now, as I was one of the first and most consistent over the last 24, 36 hours to point out that not since Rocky Marciano fought Don Coquel, a horizontal chump, has there been a greater mismatch than that between Vladimir Putin and Prigozhin? The idea that Wagner could successfully overthrow Putin was perfectly preposterous unless you are one of those whose wish overcomes their intellect, their objectivity, their ability to reason and calculate and my god we have so many of those and over so many conflicts so many little hitlers so many wars so many dictators that they have declared dead declared gone declared about to go declared must go they never learn but the people that own the so-called mainstream media never learn either and keep putting them up and on every single time. And they seem to suffer no embarrassment about the fact that they are consistently, utterly wrong about everything, but they're never as wrong about anything as they are about Russia. It is, in Britain at least, an historic disease, a condition, a hatred of Russia that predates Putin predates even the communists, the Bolsheviks, predates the Russian Revolution, predates uh, the aforementioned Tsar Alexander, goes back all the way to Catherine the Great because Russia has a potential imperial rival uh, to the British, has been hated throughout, even though the royal families of Russia and Britain were, of course, interconnected all of them grandsons of Queen Victoria. The detestation of Russia ever since the Crimean War has of course been even more deep. And the hatred of Bolshevism of the British leadership has never passed even though Bolshevism truly has. I've got to say this to you and I know that many of you don't want to hear it. And many of you will not even believe it. But Russia is not the Soviet Union. And I don't say that as if it was a good thing. If Russia was the Soviet Union, Prigozhin would not have got off the mark. The KGB troops, the blocking troops, would never have allowed them to get anywhere near Rostov on Don. Never mind to temporarily take charge of the congestion charge area of the city, which is what he did for a few hours yesterday. If Russia was the uh, Soviet Union, it would be in a much better and stronger place. Trust me on that in relation to the conspiracies to destroy it, which are even now underway and will never cease, will never stop until they have broken Russia up into what they think are constituent parts, weakened it forever, and dispensed with a rival to them, and even a rival that can trump them, they will never rest. So Russia is not the Soviet Union, and Putin is not Lenin. His remarks in the midst of this crisis about 1917, uh, which he called a stab in the back, are evidence enough of that. Putin is not Lenin, and I'm not saying that like it's a good thing either. 
People frequently think they're insulting me by calling me a Putinist or a Putin supporter. I'm not. I support Mr. Zhugano, the leader of the main opposition in Russia, that nonetheless, in the moment of crisis, stepped up to the mark and gave its absolute support to the president, to the republic, and to the unity of the Russian world, which we must now increasingly think and speak of. But it happened. It was allowed to go forward bloodlessly because Putin did not want to call on his armed forces to open fire, not just on fellow Russians, not just on fellow members of the Russian armed forces, but fellow Russian members of the armed forces that had acquitted themselves heroically in battle. They might be rapists and murderers and scum, as the West called them, but they sure could fight a kind of dirty dozen with Prigozhin as Clint Eastwood in the movie, or Ernest Borgnine, perhaps. The truth is, though, that if he did that, if he embarked on that, what turned out to be a mass protest rather than an attempt at a coup, I mean, it wasn't January 6th, was it? There weren't people running around with buffalo heads on. There weren't people casting their mantras and their black magic in the corridors of the Kremlin. It wasn't a real coup like that. It wasn't like the coup uh, on Elm Street in 1963 when the Americans murdered their own president in broad daylight. It wasn't that kind of a coup. It was more comic opera. It was more demonstrative than anything else. But our good friend Scott Ritter thinks uh, that uh, Prigozhin was paid by foreign elements to do it. I don't often second guess Scott Ritter, and I seldom feel that I've had any cause to, but I don't agree with them about that. If it's true that the Americans gave arguably billions of dollars, maybe that 6.2 billion that they found behind the cushion in the sofa in the Pentagon, but if they paid them anything at all, they didn't get value for money. That is for sure. And I don't think that Prigozhin, already a vastly rich oligarch, had any need of their money. I think sometimes when it looks like a duck, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, that's because it is a duck. I think it was one of these squabbles uh, at the top between people, the narcissism of the small difference, which became elevated to the point of ridiculousness in Prigozhin's mind and set him off on the course of action. So I disagree with Scott Ritter on that. But it has to be acknowledged that there is a third way. It has to be acknowledged that it may be neither Mr. Ritter's or mine story, theory, thesis that comes to be seen as the truth. Because there's increasingly a lot of reason to think that this was all a hoax organized between Putin and Prigozhin. And if so, it would be the hoax of the 21st century. At its most extreme form, Prigozhin is approached by the United States who offer him a vast sum of money, half now, half later, when you've done the job, if you will organize a coup and overthrow President Putin. Prigozhin takes the half and tells Putin. And between the two of them, they organize what happened over the last 36 hours. Now I can hear one or two skeptical voices. Except when I look at it, now that Prigozhin is in Belarus, a matter of fact, a mere 100 kilometers away from Kiev, that doesn't sound like a kind of exile that you would send a traitor onto. 
sounds more like a place you would send someone who remains a vital threat to NATO and its satrapy in Kiev. After all, they got within a few hours of Moscow, but they are now within minutes of Kiev. Now, this theory of all to steal the Americans' money, make a fool of Andrew Neil and, and John Simpson and so on, have much weight, wouldn't carry if it were not for the following. If Putin wanted to smoke out within his regime, within his elite, amongst the oligarchs in his capital city of Moscow, this was the ideal way to do it. After all, the West and its correspondents were telling us that Putin's hours were numbered, not that his days were numbered, that nobody was going to fight for him, that Prigozhin was going to drive right through the Kremlin gates. Well, it would be useful to know who amongst his circle and amongst the wider elite in Russia would have been happy if that had come to pass. Well, now he knows, as it was, Nobody at all, never mind anybody of importance, nobody at all backed Prigozhin. Everybody, everybody backed Putin. Everybody in the upper strata of the armed forces, the FSB, the intelligence community, the politicians, the opposition in the Duma, uh, the media aristocracy and the oligarchs, so far as we know, all of them remained loyal to Putin. So how can we disprove this theory? Well, if that is not Prigozhin sleeping on that bench in Minsk, and it makes sense that it might be, I thought as soon as I saw it, that it was him. But if it isn't, if he prospers, in Minsk, if his men begin quietly to transfer to the Belarus border, a hundred kilometers from Kiev, if he doesn't find a balcony to fall off, if his money is not touched, if he does not come to an unhappy ending at the hands of the FSB or GRU or one of the other Russian agencies, uh, then that will tend to be evidence supporting the idea that the entire thing was a confidence trick. If, of course, the corollary is also true, if, the, if he is a man looking for a balcony to fall off, if we never hear of him again, if his money mysteriously disappears and they found millions and millions of dollars in cash in his headquarters in St. Petersburg, if that money isn't returned to him, if his name is never mentioned again, if Wagner becomes Tchaikovsky and is fully integrated into the Russian armed forces, then the theory that it was all set up by Putin in the first place will begin to hold less and less water. But if the opposite is true, and if we see him on top of a tank making the very short 100 kilometer journey to Kiev, well, we'll know that all was not what it seemed. A riddle inside, a mystery inside, an enigma. But then that's what Russia has always been for those who cannot understand it because of the myopia of their own hatred, the myopia of their own inability to see clearly through the fog that oftentimes surrounds times of war. We are very fortunate tonight that our first guest knows even more about 
military political issues than me and Scott Ritter. He's Colonel Douglas McGregor, and he's coming up right after this. It's going to be, I tell you, the mother of all talk shows. Many people today struggle with the common mainstream media consumer. These types of people are mindless zombies. Instead of living authentically, they feed off masking their true thoughts and feelings, doing nothing and criticizing those who actually do their research. This type of media consumer can be highly manipulative, so here are some golden standard clapbacks when they start with their propaganda. When they say you are too much for them, show them a mirror and tell them to look for less. Draw a diagram of where your business is and their business is to visually show them they are in the wrong area. When they say, please watch this clip from this reputable BBC journalist, remind them that there are no longer any reputable BBC journalists and to instead watch the mother of all talk shows for some real journalism. The next time you encounter a brainwashed zombie, hold your head high and know their obsession to eat your brain is masking their jealousy of your confidence, your freedom in self-expression, and most importantly, your authenticity. <coughs> Keep listening to learn more on the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now we've got a poll running. Who will win the battle of the billionaires, Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg? Thousands of you have voted, somewhat to my surprise, and there's only one winner so far. Get voting on Twitter, on Telegram, and on YouTube. Now, Colonel Douglas McGregor has forgotten more about war and military politics than almost anyone on the planet. That's why you won't find him on the mainstream television, because they want fools who will feed the narrative that they have already prescribed as the one they want the masses to swallow. But we're not like that here on the mother of all talk shows. We want to get as far as possible to the truth. That's why Colonel Douglas McGregor joins us now. Colonel, thank you for coming back on the show. It's been some time uh, since we met. Um, well, let's start with the overview, if uh, we can. What do you think happened in Russia over the last 36 hours? Well, I wouldn't call it a coup. Uh, I think what happened is that Mr. Prigozhin, who, as you know, is a well-known blowhard and has frequently said outrageous things, reached a conclusion that I think a lot of people in the senior ranks of the Russian army have reached, and that is two things. First, that this war has dragged on too long, and they want Putin to take decisive action to end it. And then secondly, uh, I, I think the... Uh, Fear is that the United States will be tempted to intervene in Western Ukraine with its Polish allies and others potentially if this does not come to an end. And so Prigozhin staged this. He went down to Rostov to the theater command center. He stayed there. There was no violence, but then he dispatched 4,000 troops to go toward Moscow. 30,000 troops in the Moscow garrison were mobilized and prepared to fight. And ultimately, Russian aircraft and attack helicopters were used against the 4,000 troops that Prigozhin had sent toward Moscow. So at least in Moscow, people took this very seriously. As soon as there was any indication of fighting and that anyone could be killed, Prigozhin immediately called a halt to it. Lukashenko, who has known Mr. Prigozhin for 20 years at least and is a close friend of his, spoke with Putin, who gave him permission to talk directly to Prigozhin, and the outcome was, as you say, Prigozhin leaves and goes to Belarusia. Uh, there will be no charges against him. And one of the reasons for that is that both the Wagner Group and Prigozhin are very popular with the Russian people. They see him as the kind of aggressive leader that they want on the battlefield in this war with Ukraine. 
So I think what we have now to expect is a very powerful offensive will be leashed, unleashed, that is, against the Ukrainians. And then secondly, I think you're going to see some changes at the top of the Russian command structure. I would expect General Sorovikin in particular to rise as a result of this. But like you, I see no evidence, frankly, that uh, Mr. Prigozhin was made an agent by MI6 or the CIA or anybody else. Anybody who knows the Russians knows that any senior officer or commander or leader is surrounded by numerous FSB informants. The idea that he could have sold out even if he'd wanted to seems ludicrous. Yes, that's also my view. Uh, let's uh, start at Machiavelli in The Prince. He warns uh, the powerful against reliance on the mercenary. Uh, it would never have happened in the old days that I look back on more fondly than you do. Uh, the idea that a Bonaparte would be allowed to arise uh, within the state uh, is uh, fanciful. Zhukov didn't last long on his white horse after the victory parade in 1945, precisely for that reason. And I apologize for comparing Zhukov with Prigozhin, but uh, it makes my point uh, that how did it come to pass that the Russians allowed the growth of this mercenary power inside their uh, polity, their military polity, and a man like Prigozhin at the head of it? Well, I would reject uh, the notion that these people are mercenaries. I would compare them to the French Foreign Legion. The French Foreign Legion consists of large numbers of non-Frenchmen in many cases, but they have sworn allegiance to the French state and the French nation, and no one has fought harder and more loyally for France than the French Foreign Legion. I would say you have something very similar in the Wagner Group. Uh, these are still Russians overwhelmingly, but there are numbers of Serbs or some Germans or others in the group, and they too have sworn allegiance to the Russian state. And as far as we can tell, none of them thought that they were marching on Moscow to remove Putin. On the contrary, they saw themselves as going to Moscow to rescue Putin from what uh, was widely considered bad advisors, bad counselors, who have held up the Russian offensive and caused this war to drag out beyond the point of reason. Well, let's turn to that, for that is, of course, the most important point. Uh, the, the, the dichotomy has been although you wouldn't think it, reading the Western media, between people who want more and harder war in Ukraine and people like Putin who want to proceed cautiously, uh, bit by bit, uh, not going farther than they need to, not doing more than they must. Uh, and that balance is bound to have been deleteriously affected from the point of view of Ukraine and its uh, Western backers, uh, which makes it all the more odd that they were cheering on Prigozhin quite so enthusiastically, Colonel. I think you're dealing with a lot of wishful thinkers in the West. These are the same people that continue to tell everyone that the Russians are incompetent, stupid, badly led, uh, poorly organized. That's all nonsense. This is The Russians have proven, if anything, to be extremely professional, very competent. I think a number of things have occurred, though, in recent months. One is that it's very clear that the Ukrainians have collapsed militarily for all intents and purposes. The casualties they've taken are horrific. There really isn't much left. And lots of senior officers, and I'm sure Sorovikin is one of them, have said, look, let's get on with this, put an end to this regain control of everything east of the Dnieper, uh, regain control of Odessa, then we can decide what we want to do next. The second thing is there's been a lot of very dangerous talk in Washington about nuclear weapons. Uh, you have this piece of legislation that's under consideration in the Senate that talks about threatening Russia with nuclear strikes if they detect anything that they consider to be evidence for a Russian nuclear uh, operation. The Russians have made it very clear they will not use nuclear weapons unless we do. However, Zelensky has been encouraging his forces to attack the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant on the Dnieper River. 
The Russians have guarded it and protected it, tried to shut it down as much as possible because they don't want the radioactivity loose. But this is the kind of dirty bomb threat that Zelensky has made real for a long time. As a result, the Russians, I think, collectively have said, good Lord, what happens if this man Zelensky succeeds in something at the plant uh, that it amounts to a dirty bomb or the equivalent of it? And then the U.S. uses it as an excuse to intervene and launch a tactical nuclear weapon against us. I think these things were also in Prigozhin's mind. I guess why Prigozhin said, I've got to do something dramatic to get Putin's attention. Remember, Putin and he have known each other for many years. This is, this is, not, uh, this is not what people think. That's why I don't buy the notion it's a coup. I think he got Putin's attention. I think we're going to see change at the top, and I think this offensive is going to be unleashed. That's the outcome that Prigozhin wanted. And well, that to be now unleashed, uh, it would indeed, as you put it, uh, be everything up to the river and everything to the south, uh, including virtually the whole of the seaboard and certainly including Odessa. That would leave a, a rump state, to put it kindly, a kind of Kosovo uh, style rump entity uh, that would be of interest, I would have thought, to at least the Poles and maybe even the Hungarians also, uh, and, and would redraw the, the map uh, completely. Would the Americans shrug and accept that? Or would that strengthen the Lindsey Grahams and uh, Blumenthal and the like, who clearly want America and Russia in a toe-to-toe -to -toe shooting war including shooting nuclear missiles uh, in Europe. Well, I don't know that uh, the fools in Washington really want a nuclear confrontation. I think they enjoy threatening it. They don't understand uh, what they're talking about. And I know the Russians don't. Uh, there's much truth in what you're saying, except that I would point out that Putin would probably accept almost any solution on the west side of the Dnieper along the lines that you described, provided whatever emerges in this rump state is neutral. And that was the real concern from the very beginning. Uh, he wasn't interested in going to war. He wasn't interested in marching into Kiev or anything else. He simply wanted Ukraine to be neutral, not a platform for NATO and the United States to use against him. And if uh, we and uh, the people that border Russia are willing to sign a treaty that accepts neutrality for what remains, I'm sure that Putin would go along with it. No foreign bases, no foreign forces. That would be his concern. Yes, uh, and of course, that could have been uh, achieved. Uh, in fact, an outcome less onerous than that could have been achieved under the aegis of President Erdogan uh, until Boris Johnson was dispatched to quash it. Do you think he did that of his own volition, or did Washington tell him to? Uh, how do I uh, say this as diplomatically as possible? London is Washington's puppet. End of discussion. So unfortunately, no, he didn't think of it on his own, though he's quite capable of dumb ideas, I agree. But nevertheless, this dumb idea came out of Washington to keep the war going. It's, it's over. The people in Washington know the Ukrainians are finished. They know they can't replace the losses. The question now is what comes next? And nobody wants to accept publicly the fact that the Russians are in a strategically powerful and dominant position. That's not going to change. But there is still margin for mistakes and error. There's still an opportunity here for someone to push too far, for an opportunity for the U.S. to engage in, a, in an intervention that could widen this war and make it Europe-wide. That's the real danger. We're not prepared for it, by the way. Let's be quite clear on this. We don't have the ammunition. We don't have the forces on the ground. But it's it's not impossible. And I think that's what drove Prigozhin. I think that's what concerns the senior officers in the Russian army. They want to end it. Now, uh, the uh, senior officers, uh, undoubtedly, mm -hmm. at the front, are tired of the Minister of Defense. They're tired of the top brass back in Moscow. Do you think that replacing them, rotating them, finding some way of 
nudging them sidewards or upstairs to the boardroom or whatever, was part of the negotiation with Prigozhin? Yes, although I'm sure that uh, President Putin did not uh, obligate himself to do exactly what Prigozhin argued should be done. Nevertheless, I think, yes, he understands now clearly that Prigozhin is not the Lone Ranger. Everyone at the top, or almost everyone, in the battlefield wants to get on with this. It reminds me, frankly, of 1990 and 91, when we were sitting in the desert and suddenly there were discussions about turning the border between Saudi Arabia and Kuwait into something like the Korean border, something that Colin Powell at the time seemed to advocate, and we feared that most of the Army four stars would accept. Fortunately, President Bush rejected that out of hand and said no. And we were all greatly relieved when we attacked because we didn't want to sit in that desert eternally. Now, I think the same feeling is very widespread inside the ranks of the Russian army. People are sitting there. I don't want to be here next year. So let's get on with this. Let's attack. Let's destroy these people. Let's force people to the table, come up with an agreement, and we can go home. Now, is things, uh, are things rather uh, changing in Washington? After all, Joe Biden visibly enfeebled, uh, sorry to say this uh, as diplomatically as I can. Uh, London may be Washington's puppet, but the puppet master uh, in the Oval Office leaves a very great deal to be desired. Seldom can there have been a ventriloquist as unimpressive as Joe Biden, but he looks enfeebled, he looks confused. He looks not an inch the war leader. And he's now got Donald Trump emerged as the leader of the anti-war movement in America. And he's got RFK Jr. inside his own party, burning up the track with, if anything, an even more trenchant anti-war position. And we're not that far distant from the next uh, primaries and then the next presidential election. Do you think things might begin to change on the home front in that regard? <clears throat> well, first of all, I think uh, our friend Biden is a, is a cutout. I don't think he's actually in charge of much. I think he reads from the script that's presented to him. He has powerful forces behind him, powerful donors, and he's got key people in the administration who are helping to manage and handle him. <clears throat> so, they're going to keep him there as long as they possibly can because he's at least a face that Americans don't necessarily hate. They may not think much of him, but they don't hate him. Uh, but he may not last out the year. And if he doesn't last, then our friend Kamala Harris, who may temporarily become vice president, won't last long. Everyone knows that she's not capable of exercising uh, the powers of the office. So the question is, who comes next? As far as the future election is concerned, many of us in the United States have no faith in the electoral integrity of our system. There's too much cheating, too much lying, mass absentee ballots, mass vo uh, voter mail-in ballots, all sorts of nonsense that provides in the blue states opportunities for cheating. So I'm not sure, <clears throat> I'm not sure when change comes, it necessarily will come as a result of the ballot box. That would be preferred, but I think we're in for more difficult times than that. Well, difficult, but certainly interesting. And the times will always be interesting, as long as you and I can continue to talk about them here on the mother of all talk shows, God willing. Thank you, Colonel Douglas McGregor. I'm sorry we lost the, uh, at least we lost the visual, but I hope we kept the audio. Uh, let me take a quick break while I see what has happened. Stay tuned. Welcome back uh, to the mother of all talk shows. Now, to set the scene, particularly...
and uh, and uh, all kinds of hardiness. He is, of course, former soldier and all-round sage, Brian Belichick. Uh, so many people have predicted this. Everyone has been saying for months now. I mean, we have been talking about this for months. Uh, how NATO's plan of gifting Ukraine another army after they spent their their previous military on the, the fall offenses of last year. They were sending a hodgepodge of equipment that Ukrainian soldiers have never used before. Didn't get nearly enough training. People don't understand that uh, incorporating a new weapon system into a military force usually takes years, not a few months. Let me give you an update on the legend that is Norma in Bristol. She's Fagash Flo on Twitter. If you would like to send her good wishes. She said, I'll be discharged from hospital on Friday having some help and my sons to stay over a few nights as pain is worse in the night. Slow progress, but hopefully the worst is over, folks. I wish you very well indeed, Norma, and your family, and I hope it's not long before we hear your dulcet voice again on the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Somebody somewhere didn't want that interview to be seen, but at least it was heard, I understand, for the most part. And uh, you can guess. uh, In fact, we should do a poll on who it was that didn't want that interview to be seen, but it was a cracking interview, I believe, one that will live. Who will win the battle of the billionaires? I had no idea that Mark Zuckerberg would be as little fancied. On uh, Telegram, 10%, say Zuckerberg. On Twitter, 20%. Uh, On the YouTube community poll, 14. On the YouTube stream, 15 uh, and on Telegram, 90, Twitter, 80, YouTube, com, 86, and YouTube, stream, 85 for Elon Musk. Now, I don't know what the rules uh, are that they're going to be using. Uh, I assume they'll be the Queensbury rules, uh, but they may, of course, be these Americanized cage fighting, savage beast uh, kind of fights. I don't know. If it's a savage beast fight... I'd probably find man uh, with, the, with the harder punch. But if it was a proper uh, fight under the Queensbury rules, my inclination would be to back Zuckerberg. He seems to me to be taller with a longer reach, a bit more elegance about his gait, about his movement. And I'm told that he's quite a fitness guy, practicing jujitsu uh, for considerable parts of the day as his company crashes and burns. So I don't know how I would have voted on this poll. In fact, I didn't really want this poll uh, anyway, but the editor put it on me. And to my amazement, 13,000 of you have already voted. Now, thanks to Jurgen, Hassan and Neil for sharing the show on Twitter. Please keep hitting the like button and share this broadcast with your friends. Here's the phone numbers. 0808196552 if you're in Britain or Ireland. That's 0808196552. Entirely free, remember. And toll free in the US and Canada also. If you are there, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And if you're in the rest of the world, it's four four two zero three nine double six two six two. Five. Let's take some calls. Uh, David in Swindon uh, in England. Go ahead, David. Thank you very much. Um, first thing, I agree with you, your opening remarks as usual, because I've been steaming all day um, about the feeding frenzy of the press worldwide. The last time we had a feeding frenzy like this was on the 15th of November last year. And that was when that, uh, so say, um, Russian missile fell in Poland. Do you remember? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and the, 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 then it was the start of the Third World War. The Americans were saying we're going to invoke Article 5 or whatever. 
Next day, it had all gone. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mistake. Exactly the same as this. I think that Putin is stronger. All all the BBC, I think Putin is stronger. He's actually got rid of this, um, I don't know, so say coup, which I don't believe it was. In a, in a day, in a day, yeah. he's done it in a day. What other world leader could have put it to bed in a day? So now, now he's got the guy in Belarus, he's got most of the um, brigade signed up to the Russian people. So he's, he's, a, he's a win-win. And I think that he should, yeah, I, I, and he will, I, I, come I think down you're stronger. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. What do you, yeah, I think so too. But what do you think of the, if you like, the alternative theory? Uh, that uh, it was all a hoax for some purpose as yet unclear. It was all too easy. The guy was never... Got up, and it's quite funny because the, mo- the thing he went up was called the M4, wasn't it? You know, the motorway that runs yes. from Ros- yes. Don up to yes. Moscow. He's called the M4. Well, I'm Moscow, on the M4. Yeah. I'm on yeah. the M4 in Swindon here. So <laughs> the, no way could he... Ever, with, yeah. two, with two battalions, could he ever have gone from, like, Bristol... Stopping along the way in Salisbury, taking over that. He never took those towns over. That was another misconception. He's saying he's he never took anything over. over. No, he never took it. He might have exactly. visited the military backs in, in um, Salisbury. He might have gone in and taken, you know, just dropped in there for, to refuel. So, but in the BBC and ITV were saying that he actually took these places over. Absolute miracle. And then, yeah, yeah. if Putin, if actually, Putin the, wanted, I'll tell you what. The, yeah, go, go on. on, go on. No, and then... Go on, go on. Let's, let's say he was going along the M4 in his tanks or whatever. Putin could have easily taken him out with some jets. You know, he could have got five fighter jets and of just course. annihilated them. And he didn't. Of and course. I agree with you. There's something underlying going on there. And and the, the frenzy yes, has died down I think down the, the, it has, but the BBC uh, was as often now, I'm sorry to say, uh, the worst of them all. They went into open air coverage uh, and their uh, frenzy could not be contained. And they misreported and they thus deceived their viewers and their compulsory license pairs. Throughout, uh, they uh, continued to talk about a 30,000 strong column advancing on Moscow, it was 4,000. And they were only advancing because the Russian military won attacking and killing them, as they could easily have done by air power alone. It was 4,000, not 30,000. It was uh, a few dozen vehicles, not hundreds of vehicles, as they were reported. They did not take over. Rostov on Don. They parked themselves outside the uh, military headquarters in the center of the town, the congestion charge area, and put uh, dynamite around them and told the public to stay away. Fired a couple of shots in the air to make sure that they did. That's not taking over Rostov on Don. The, the wish began Uh, to become fact in the minds of the hysterics, some of them literal hysterics, that have the pens, have the microphones, have the media power in our society. But here's the rub. Of course, there's a lot of sheep. Of course, the sheepdogs can still marshal the sheep, even onto the final journey. But the number of sheep is falling away. Not sharply, but steadily. And with each successive episode like this one, the credibility of the hysterics in charge of the pens and the microphones is diminished still further. That must be true. Otherwise, we must can have no faith in humanity. It must be true. That man by man, woman by woman, people start saying, wait a minute, that didn't work out the way they told us it was working out. And now that I think about it, neither did the issue before that. The submarine, the COVID, 
the Ukraine, the Prigozhin, the coup, it's one thing after another in which experts, so-called, are dragooned to ram narratives down our throats and more and more people are finding it very unpalatable and are looking elsewhere for a different point. Eve is in Idaho. He wants to talk about the coup also. Go ahead, Eve. Welcome back. Yes, thank you for having me on uh, on your beautiful show. Um, yes, uh, okay. I would like to see, are you, I will wait a number of, and I think uh, another that uh, President Putin watched very carefully is the ratio, it's a horrible name, but I don't know how to say it, between Ukrainian and Russian. And uh, during the Ukrainian offensive, the key ratio is 10 to 1. But during the, the Bakhmut offensive, many people agree that the ratio was 2 to maybe 2 and a half. So, yeah, it's a bad line, Eve. Uh, it's a bad line, and we we need to hear your thoughts, uh, which are always sagacious, indeed. So we'll try and get back to you, uh, if you don't mind. I wouldn't like to waste your call on a bad line. Uh, some YouTube comments: The amazing Blumpkin donated five U.S. dollars to the show and sends his best wishes to Norma. Thank you very much, indeed. Uh, our canarchist says, my main question is, does Putin use it like Erdogan did in Turkey, or is he more restrained? Well, I think he's a restrained sort of guy, but getting less restrained, if you get my drift. Sean PB says, Biden and Putin should have a fight like Elon and Bazookerberg. That is not a bad idea. It's a bit much asking Biden at 80 and soft in the head. Maybe Putin and Blinken? That would be a match, wouldn't it? I wish we could make it. Uh, Don Balafre says, alcoholic sicko Prigojin could stay as a hero with his Wagner soldiers, but he decided to destroy himself and fellow Wagner battalion soldiers. Well, that is another point of view. Let's hear from Rob in Southend on Putin. Go ahead, Rob. Rob, are you there? Oh dear. I'm having... Rob, are you there? Last call. No, he's not. Hello, uh, so, if you're watching... Yes, go ahead, Rob. Yes, go ahead. Oh, oh you can hear me now. I can, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, a huge fan of yours, George, by the way. Uh, I was Thank there you, at the uh, grassroots out. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful night. Um, but, uh, no, I, I, I'm really concerned about Russia breaking up. And uh, you're into geopolitics far more than I am. Uh, but I'm just uh -huh. asking one question. Uh, if Russia yeah. breaks down, how bad is that for the world? Well, it's very bad uh, because, of course, uh, Russia, as I said at the beginning, has the largest number of nuclear missiles in the world, including the most powerful nuclear weapons in the world, the hypersonic and most powerful, best, fastest, strongest, hardest, fullest of destructive power. So, by definition, instability in a state with that many nuclear weapons is a very, very dangerous idea. So why the West is so keen to foster that instability, why they were so happy of the idea uh, of a man the, the day before called a terrorist, uh, 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 a thief uh, in charge of rapists and murderers and scum out of the jails and so on, why did they want such a man to be in charge of such a nuclear arsenal? Are we led by fools, Rob, or knaves? And which would be worse is what I keep asking. Last word to you, Rob. 
Well, I think we're we're led by fools. <laughs> um, I think it's very sad, yeah. uh, and I hate the way that the mainstream media talk about the meat grinder. That just means lots of people dying. Um, we're looking at yeah. some sort of first world war scenario that's taking place, we and are, to yeah. me, it just looks terrible, absolutely terrible. I can't get any proper information from the mainstream media or from uh, the in the internet. Um, but I just know, uh, because of my own family, uh, I just know that this is a terrible, terrible thing. And we really should be talking with each other and stopping this stuff. Uh, I, 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 perhaps I'm some sort of old hippie, and I didn't realise that I was that old hippie. <laughs> yeah, you know, look, no, nothing just, wrong, just nothing wrong with uh, being an old hippie. Nothing wrong with being an old hippie. I'm an old mod, but I respect hippies. Eve is back from Idaho on a better line. Let's hear from him. Eve, start again at the beginning, would you? Yes. So what I was saying is that a parameter that the President Putin observed is the, the dead and unwooded ratio between Ukrainian and Russian. And what, uh, what uh, I have observed and he has observed too is that um, during the Ukrainian uh, offensive, he, he did much better, which have the regular troop, he did much better that with the Wagner outfit because there were not enough uh, Wagner troops. Those troops were, were uh, under tremendous, uh, um, the, the number w were not good for the Wagner. And then what he's thinking is that for the long run, it is better to fight with regular army and your, um, and your, you know, the son and daughter of the whole country, rather than to have those uh, private outfits which, uh, which uh, shield you against big casualty, but it's a lot of problem. And, that, and you, ma you mentioned with McGregor that Dukov or, um, you know, those people have a tough time after because they become powerful and, and all that. So my point is that uh, I think President Putin is now, there is more chance that he does a general mobilization. Now, my second point is that the problem for the, for the Russian is that they see that the West have, after all, a good time because they don't have any of their soldiers. They don't care about the Ukrainian soldier. And they fight on an area which is pro-Russian. So basically... Uh, uh, they don't care. So President Putin is going to look at what hurts the West on the geostrategic level. And what hurts the West on the geostrategic level because of the Montreux, you know, Montreux Accord and the Black Sea and all that is Odessa. You see? So I think if my, if there is more chance now that he does a general mobilization and that he goes all the way to Odessa, and like that, Ukraine has no more coast, and the West has, has really lost the war. That's what uh, I was thinking. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I, I'm with you on both of these substantive points. Uh, I disagree with Colonel McGregor uh, about the nature of Wagner. Uh, I agree with, with uh, Machiavelli, uh, that uh, reliance on uh, people who are paid to be there rather than there because they are defending their country, their land, their families back home and so on. Uh, I would never myself have agreed if I were, say, uh, with um, my leader, Zhuganov, uh, I would never have agreed if I'd been in the Duma to the de the deployment of and the centrality of uh, a mercenary foreign legion, if you prefer it, element so prominent in uh, in these uh, circumstances. I, I just think, as a matter of principle, it is an accident waiting to happen. Uh, I hate to speak in the same breath of uh, uh, Zhuk uh, Zhukov and Prigozhin. I hate it. But let me do so. Zhukov was the greatest general of the 20th century by a country mile. Right from 1941 
until the victory. Zhukov was a genius in military and strategic and logistical genius. And he was allowed by Stalin to ride his white horse across Red Square and take the banners uh, of victory. Uh, but he was scarcely seen again, ever again, because a state cannot allow a Bonaparte to arise within its ranks and not expect that the day might come when that Bonaparte may seize state power himself. And uh, in the case of Prigozhin, that would have been regrettable. Thank you, Eve, for a wonderful call. Uh, the rest of the show is yours on Russia, on Ukraine, on the so-called coup. We'll take your calls after this break, right to the end of the show. So you better stay tuned and get dialing. Thank you. On the line is a rose in Texas. That was at the beginning of a song. On Californication, which is a song. Rose, welcome to the show. Fan of the show, transgender fan of the show. And I wanted to briefly address your monologue from last week yeah. on Californication. Because I almost entirely agree with okay. what you said. Trans women athletes taking medals and records. Yeah. Children at nightclubs and even going to elementary schools themselves. Not to mention hormone blockers for children as well. The attack on freedom of speech, not only against conservatives, but anyone who doesn't fall in line with the agenda, rainbow flags on NATO military aircraft, which is certainly doing more to cultivate anti-queer sentiment around the world than there already is. All of that makes me sick. So because I don't believe in incest, bestiality, necrophilia, and pedophilia, I'm basically culturally right-wing by today's standards, even though less than five years ago, I'd still be left-wing. So in regards to you and everyone else uh, watching who thinks of me and people like me as the villains right now, you should know that I support the most traditional Muslim, Jewish, Abrahamic believers to be as homophobic and transphobic as they want, because guess what? That's freedom of religion, which is a value we claim to have in the West. Now, my religion, I suppose, is I believe I'm a woman, but guess what? Not everyone has to convert to my religion. Otherwise, we basically have a theocracy, only this theocracy is for the ever-evolving LGBTQIA supercalifragilistic expialidocious club. So that's all I wanted to get out of my system. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Rose, if I could put your call in a glass bottle and ship it around the world, I promise you that I would do so. Crystal clear, beautifully expressed, and I wish you every happiness in life. It is exactly what people who are transgender should be saying. And if they were, they would, uh, they would disappoint the liberal zealots who want to use them as a battering ram against the traditional family values of the rest of us. Beautifully expressed, Rose. I'll never forget it. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Okay, it's just you and me for the rest of the show. Uh, another couple of million uh, people who will ultimately watch it. Uh, make your calls. This is your night. You can give me your point of view. You can quiz me on mine. The numbers are 0808196552. If you're in the UK or Ireland, if you're in the US or Canada, plus 18449443344. If you're in the rest of the world, it's 44203-966-2625. Let's talk with Michael in Washington State. And he wants to talk about leadership, don't we all, Michael? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my call, George. You are the shining light in the dark world today. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Um, we're in a real predicament with these leaders who think that... Um, what's going on is a win. And I'd like to offer a solution for this so that when people go to vote, they can make it pretty simple. And what I've seen over the decades is that there are two types of people who lead. 
there are people who initiate and use the win-win scenario, like Donald Trump and RFK. And then there are the win-losers, uh, the destroyer types, who use the win-lose, who's someone else's loss is their gain. And I think we're filling up with a lot, a lot of destroyers in charge of things. And I think if people evaluate people that they want to vote for as either a builder type for win-win or a destroyer type that uses win-lose, I think we could make um, things much better much sooner. What do you think? Well, I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, I, I would give us the best example of win-win leadership, the Chinese leadership. Uh, in fact, sometimes to a maddening point, uh, they are utterly devoted to the win-win principle. Uh, and they apply it across their ASEAN relations, but they also apply it across their intercontinental relations, even with countries that are uh, mad at them and want to weaken and even destroy them. I mean, how do we get to a situation, for example, that a Chinese company, reportedly a CPC-linked company, a Communist Party of China-linked company, is sending $5 million, at least $5 million, to Hunter Biden. How does that compute? And in response to a threat uh, from Hunter Biden, uh, we're going to have to talk about this more deeply on another night, but Biden sent a text to a Chinese businessman telling him that he was sitting right next to his father, then the vice president of the United States. And if this Chinese man did not send him the money right away, then there would be hell to pay uh, from his father, who was on the other end of the conversation. How does that compute? Now, maybe this businessman was not politically connected. Maybe nobody in the state in China uh, knew that this corrupt relationship existed. Maybe. But it's also possible uh, to say that Joe Biden's leadership actually always, from the first day 54 years ago when he entered Washington, D.C., he's been a destroyer. If you look at his style, if you look at his legislative uh, agenda and priorities, trying to jail people that are doing exactly the same things, his son, of whom he's inordinately proud, uh, has obviously been uh, doing. I would say Biden's always been a destroyer, Michael. Last word to you. Exactly. Um and it's kind of, I'm kind of curious as to as bad as Joe Biden is uh, doing that son of a B thing or uh, getting uh, his, some guy fired in Ukraine. He could get, uh, yeah. uh, what's uh, the guy who got arrested in uh, Ukraine, the, the fellow reporter from Chile? Yeah, uh, Gonzalo. Gonzalo Lira, yeah, he could say, well, you're not going to get those weapons unless you release Gonzalo Lira. I mean, he could at least do that, as bad as he is. Yeah, of course. Of course. But he, he, he won't do that, and he won't call off the hounds of Julian Assange. He's, he's a mean and vindictive guy. I have no idea why people think him grandfatherly. I wouldn't let him near any of my kids or grandkids. Michael, thank you for that call. Uh, Sarkar is in Scotland, in Glasgow. On the same subject, go ahead, Sarkar. Good evening, George. Thank you so much for once again having me on my show. Thank you, George. Yes. George, Welcome. I have a small question, Welcome. basically. See, there's a limit to lying. The Western media's lying is reaching the limits of disproportionate, unending, how should I say, of, of, of a pit for which there's no ending. For the past one year, yeah. they have been saying, all sorts of things about Putin, about him having cancer, Alzheimer's, cannot even walk properly, falls off his bed. Yeah. But I saw I him forgot, giving a speech yeah. yesterday. 
he's much more fitter at 70 than I am at 40. I'll be honest, and that's despite all the disease. Zelensky said a few months ago he could have died. Oh my God, how did he give a speech yesterday? Maybe the Russians have got such technology they can bring a dead man alive. Our NHS could try some of that. And finally, George, since yesterday, whether it's the right-wing Daily Mail or Telegraph or the so-called left-wing Guardian, have been obsessing about a coup. Supposedly Putin will be gone by tonight, or uh, by, by yesterday night, or to, today morning. Lo, behold... Within a few hours, the so-called coup was done, dusted. The West just don't realize all the traps, all the quagmires. They are being for the others. They are falling in their own trap. They have learned nothing from Libya and Afghanistan. They are learning nothing from this Ukraine-Russia crisis. They will learn nothing apart from spreading misinformation. They are going nowhere. When will the Western media and the readers realize that the more you trust your media, the more you're doing yourself a disservice because the truth is not what is being shown to you? I'd like to hear your views, George. Well, uh, very powerfully put, uh, uh, they are reaching the limits of their own credibility. That is for sure. I mean, there's only so many times you can march them up to the top of the hill and have to march them back down again. At least one would hope there's only so many times that you can do it. They've done it often enough. I mean, even uh, you're 40, lucky you, but in my, in my lifetime, you know, it's been one after the other. It's, you know, it's been starting with, with Nasser, uh, with, with Arafat, with Gaddafi, with Milosevic, with, with, uh, with um, Gaddafi, with, with Saddam Hussein, with Bashar al-Assad, uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin. It's one after another. And they somehow have managed, at least with enough people, to have gotten uh, John Doe and Mary Doe to hate all these people that I've just mentioned. There are many more that I uh, don't have time to mention. It's like a switch is flipped and... Everybody becomes, have you noticed how everyone's an expert, by the way? How they became an expert on submersibles in 48 hours last week uh, when the, when the, when the, how shall I put it? I don't want to be hurtful. It was a kind of hoax. They knew that this submarine had been destroyed and they allowed this vast media circus uh, to gather around it and everybody became uh, an expert on submersibles, just like everybody became an expert on, on vaccines and on, on uh, viruses and so on. I, it's amazing how people can go from the next big thing to the next big thing with such consummate ease. But the one thing in common is that the establishment narrative on one thing after another is falling shorter and shorter and shorter. And so far off the mark, particularly over the war in Ukraine and the events in Russia, that one imagines at least that they are burning a fuse uh, that uh, will not stand too much more burning. Thank you, uh, Sarkar. An email tonight. Uh, on air at moats.tv is my email address. George, watching moats and RT gives me the true picture of worldly events week after week. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Rob in Toronto is on the line, on the bricks. Go ahead, Rob. Hey, George. I just want to say, uh, first of all, I agree with you 100% on the Prigozhin situation. I think he's got a high opinion of himself. And I think this is just simply a case of him going off the reservation. Um, I, I actually I have a couple that, yeah. of questions. I use that for, very for phrase. And my kids told me not to. I use that very phrase, Rob. My my kids told me it, it wasn't it wasn't appropriate. I, I said oh, exactly really? that. He's gone off the reservation. He's gone off the reservation. Apparently, we're not allowed to say that now. Anyway, go on. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes, I did want to ask. I've got a couple questions for you. Number one, I did want to get your opinion on uh, President Macron's uh, request to attend the upcoming uh, BRICS meeting. Uh, mm. We both know that yeah. Macron is as slippery as an eel. 
So I'd like to get your opinion of yeah. what he believes his true intentions are, because we haven't heard a lot in the Western media about it. Uh, second thing I'd like to ask you about is about uh, the lithium industry and its growing importance. Uh, as you know, lithium is used to create a number of technologies. Uh, countries like Chile and Mexico have recently around, announced plans to nationalize their industries. Uh, so it would appear that we're moving towards uh, some sort of cartel-type OPEC-like situation, but for lithium. Also, George, you may recall, probably about three months ago, Iran announced that they had discovered the second largest reserve of lithium in the world, and that effectively it placed them in the top five reserves in the world overnight. And at the time, I was thinking to myself, this is a major, major news item, not just for Iran, but for the entire world. And since that time, I've heard zip about it. Uh, I'd like to get your perspective yeah. on the industry, and it would also be interesting to get Professor Mirandi's perspective on it next time he's on. I really appreciate when you have him on. I think we need to get more perspectives from uh, folks in Iran. Uh, th those are the only two questions I yeah. had really tonight. Yeah. Well, I, I, never was the word only more otios because they were both uh, terrific uh, questions. Uh, on Professor Morandi, by the way, I, I noticed that he's actually in Moscow. Uh, and maybe, maybe we can uh, try and get him on Wednesday for the midweek show on, on both those points on Iran and on how the atmosphere is in Russia from what he can observe. Uh, when you mentioned lithium, it was the first thing that came into my mind. And that is that Iran is now one of the top two, top three, uh, top dogs in the world on lithium. Uh, and that's why we don't hear about it, because it is unalloyed good news for the Iranian people that in addition to their oil and gas reserves, in addition to their superabundant agriculture, uh, they are now going to be one of the world's biggest producers of one of the world's most important uh, commodities, raw materials, that nothing works, nothing works without lithium. And the countries that have got it are the countries least sympathetic to the empire and its diktat. So that's a problem. So we don't hear about it, uh, Rob, because they're still working out what they can do about it, whether they can find some way of keeping control of it, getting their dirty hands on it. It's a bit like the gold in, in Uganda. Did you know that, that Uganda now has trillion T, trillions of dollars of gold that it has discovered? And it's governed by uh, a president, a government, that again is quite hostile actually to the empire and its diktat and quite friendly actually with China and Russia. My goodness, they're on a losing run, the empire, that is for sure. Thanks for the call, Rob. Let's go to England, Wolverhampton, where Mark wants to talk about the coup. Go ahead, Mark. Hello. Mm. Hello, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'm just calling. My mum watches your show all the time. She's with me. I think it's a big conspiracy. I think that this was all staged so Putin could send him to Belarus so they can plan an attack while the Ukrainians are busy in the south. They can plan an attack on Kiev. And there's also nuclear bombs now that have been put in Belarus. So why would he trust him to go there if there's, you know, dangerous weapons there, if he's already tried well, a coup uh, uh, in, in Moscow? Yeah, as I said in my, my monologue, it is an interesting, tantalizing, intriguing uh, turn of events. I have long thought that, that the final assault uh, on Kiev, if such an assault lamentably uh, becomes necessary and happens. I very much hope not. Never wanted it. Never wanted this war in the first place. But if an assault on Kiev, the capture, 
subjugation of Kiev, the surrender of the leadership of Ukraine is required. I've long believed that it will be launched from uh, the Belarus border, which, as I repeat, is 100 kilometers, which I don't know the exact uh, correlation, but it's, it's about 60 miles. And that means it's about an hour, an hour and a bit from the Belarus border to Kiev. That's a pretty short journey, right? And, yeah. uh, and Prigozhin looks like he, he enjoys a, a journey. And yes, uh, the Russian uh, nuclear weapons are now in Belarusia. So the question is, if he ends up sleeping on a bench, there's no conspiracy. Uh, if he ends up falling off a balcony, there's been no conspiracy. But if he ends up still in charge uh, of a substantial military force on the Ukrainian border in Belarus, well, maybe you're right, Mark. Maybe that is what happened. Last word to you. Uh, that's it. That's, you've answered the question. Thank you, George. Say hello, Mum. Thank hello, you. Darling. Give, give, give your you? mum my regards. Hello. I, Mark, I was just... I was just saying, give your mum my regards, and there you are on the line. Lovely to hear from you both. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, thanks to Mark, Aisha, Shelby, and James for sharing the show on Twitter. This is a new thing that we want to encourage. Please share it uh, on Twitter and subscribe on the YouTube channel if you aren't already. Help Moats grow. If you're watching on YouTube, please leave a like also. Helps us with the algorithms. Uh, more comments now. Sister, I'm a poet. I'm pretty sure when this was going on, Sky News described the Wagner leader as brutal. Is it Wagner or Wagner? Uh, Forrest1989 says Ho Chi Minh was a pastry chef and his best general, Nguyen Giap, was a history teacher. Yet they soundly beat France and the USA during the Vietnam Wars. Indeed. War is too important to be left to generals. Let's take a quick break till I uh, wet my throat, and then it's your calls all the way to the end. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens, said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. By the way, you must take a look back at our German show uh, earlier this evening, Mozart Deutsch. It was a fascinating discussion. I think by now the subtitles are up, so even if you can't speak German yet, you'll be able to uh, watch it. Uh, Dieter Dem, my uh, counterpart there, uh, spoke to two very well-known people in the German-speaking world, Swiss peace researcher Daniel Ganser uh, and Ulrika Guerrero uh, about academic freedom, blacklisting the war. It really was uh, terrific. I watched it myself, and you should look back at it. Let's see Zoya uh, in Rhode Island in the United States. Uh, let's hear what 
she has to say. Zoya, welcome. Hi, George. How are you? By the grace of God, good. And the better for hearing from you, what would you like to say? Well, first, on Purgosian and the capacity of the U.S. or someone else to buy him off, uh, yeah. one thing people have forgotten is the DOJ, in their complaint against Purgosian and his companies, um, they cited him as the principal in a firm called Concord Management and Consulting, LLC. Now, in 2020, they dismissed the case because his lawyers were asking for discovery requests that would supposedly jeopardize methods and sources if the DOJ turned that information over. Now, after the Donziger case, mm. this was in the United States Federal District Court of Columbia, of District Columbia. Mm. So yeah. after the Donziger case, the idea that the DOJ wouldn't be able to get the judge to suppress, you know, and say, no, you can't have that information strikes me as really ridiculous. But the thing is, mm. in 2022, the New York Times did an article on that firm and when the DOJ dismissed that complaint, they said the company had no presence in the U.S. But in 2022, when the New York Times linked that company to Roman Abramovich, they said it was in Terrytown, New York. So, as we all remember, Putin's deal with the oligarchs was you can have your money, but you can't mess around in politics. Well, Prigozhin mm. succeeded in that environment. Concord Management and uh, Consulting invested Russian oligarchs' money outside of Russia. So my theory is that if he couldn't be bought, they might have said, we know where your assets are and we will take them from you. Well, that is a tantalizing uh, lead, and I'm sure many uh, will even now be reaching for the keyboard to research it, Zoya. I'm grateful for it. I don't myself keep a track on these oligarchs uh, because I find them so repugnant. Uh, they offend every fiber of my being, having been close for almost all of my life to Russia, a different kind of Russia. The idea that these uh, cheap hoodlums and, and uh, market stall holders uh, could have become billionaires at the expense of the Russian people and worse can be spending and shipping those billions outside of Russia rather than keeping them in. They thrived uh, during the Yeltsin era. Uh, I think it's fair to say Putin has a different relationship to the oligarchy than Yeltsin, a better one, but still not good enough from my point of view. Uh, the idea that these people are still out there with all their largesse that they, in the beginning, took from the Russian people themselves and by shipping their wealth abroad are depriving the Russian people, even until now, of the ability to have a share, even if just a share in a, a more buoyant economy. Uh, than, than they should. So I don't myself keep track of these oligarchs. One blends into the other for me. But when you mention Roman Abramovich, uh, of course uh, I'm aware of him. And don't get me started on him. So we'll look at this uh, Concord management story uh, in the New York Times and briefly in the courts of uh, the district uh, of Colombia, uh, and maybe we'll look at that and discuss it another time. Zoya, thank you for a lovely call. Michael is in Ireland on Prigozhin. Let's hear from him. Michael, what would you like to say? Hello, George. Hi. Hello. Listen, George, love the show. If there, uh, yes, you're on the show. You're You're talking to the world. If there were ever was such a thing as a prophet, George, you fit the bill. There is no doubt of that. Well, thank you. I'm not a prophet, but uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm what I know about, Michael, I really, really know about. 
Uh, there's lots of things I don't know anything about or very little about. But what I do know about, I really, really know about it. And it turns out I know a very great deal more about it than those paid handsomely uh, to falsely prophesy. Put it that way. But and this is quite I, true, I'm a George. religious this man, so I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot be a prophet. Go ahead. You know what they say, George? You know, you get the most flack when you're closest to the target. You know what I mean? Yes, That's the way it yes, goes. But back to Mr. Bogosian. I do yeah. believe that, I, I don't believe the narratives that they're putting out. I definitely think, like your last caller, Mark, or the, not your last caller, one of your callers, that there is something just not right. It doesn't sit right. And I know mm -hmm. that people talk about that they have massive defences in around the border with Belarus. But you see, I mean, these dragon teeth and things like that, Russia know how to put them in, so I'm sure they know how to take them out. And yeah. I just have this, it just doesn't sit right. You know what I mean? I mean, this is Russia. No, I agree. I, I, I agree. I mean, I still don't believe the conspiracy theory. But I'm, I'm beginning to lean a little bit in that direction. Uh, there are too many strange things as yet unanswered. I mean, for, let me give you one, Michael. Uh, if it were true, as the Mail, Daily Mail claims today, humor me, if it was true that uh, Russia lost 39 pilots to uh, Prigozhin in the last 36 hours, Hours. That's what the mail says. Well, first of all, where are the pictures? Where is the video? I actually haven't seen any video of one aircraft being hit by Wagner. Not one. Never mind 39. And if Prigozhin had killed 39 Russian pilots, well, clearly uh, he would not be uh, being sent on a grace and favor trip to Belarus. Uh, he'd be up against the wall in the Lubyanka uh, getting a bullet in the back of his head right now. Uh, so uh, he isn't in the Lubyanka. He is in Minsk. I haven't seen any evidence that he spilt any blood at all, rendering the front page of the Mail on Sunday uh, actually a scandal sheet of lies, a der Sturmer of lies. And surely that can't be true. Last word to you, Mike. I agree with you there, but there was a video put on the military summary channel. It wasn't of a, an, uh, uh, an aircraft, it was of a, a truck coming up the road. And it said that the mm. Russians had uh, actually a helicopter, had shot a missile and blown this truck up. But they went through the whole video. Yeah, but that, and there was that no video, missile. That, was... no missile, no. I mean, I did see a helicopter uh, have a missile fired at it, uh, which missed by a mile uh, and blew up a, a fuel dump outside Rostov. Now, these videos could be cut and spliced together from anywhere. Whose missile? Whose helicopter? When? I haven't seen any convincing evidence yet. I've not seen everything, so it might be there. But I have not seen any, and I'm following it quite closely, as you can imagine, convincing evidence that the Prigozhin column killed anybody in the course of its so-called march for justice, coup, or whatever you want to call it. And if that's true, that would explain why a deal was possible to be made and how uh, Prigozhin came to be in Minsk. Michael, thank you for your lovely words. Uh, my Patreons keep me going, uh, and James Butler is one of those, and he says, anyone who thinks all this is a serious threat to Putin and Russia badly underestimated him. This is smoke and mirrors. Something big is going to happen in the next month in the next week, I think, James. Uh, and uh, a moat's legend uh, has written, Graham Briggs White uh, says this one about the poll. But why can't the entire real left 
unite to form another party, Tusk, the Workers' Party of Britain and the rest. No one has been able to give me a satisfactory answer. Uh, well, we're ready to work with all kinds of people, but we're not going to join a party uh, with which we have fundamental disagreements. And we have fundamental disagreements uh, with some of those that you mentioned there. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're not prepared to work with them. And I appeal to all such organizations to join us in no to NATO, no to war. Because that's simple. We all agree on its demands, don't we? Don't we? And if we do, why are we not all together in that broad front uh, to try and get Britain out of NATO, try and stop the war? I'll be speaking, I'm indeed chairing and speaking at the next uh, online meeting of No to NATO, No to War, which is next Thursday. So uh, please keep looking out for the details, the speakers and the coordinates uh, of that. And Chris Divismus, a.k.a. Bartram, says the big question for me is, does Elon Musk have a conscience? And is the Tucker Carlson monologue evidence that he might? I don't know. I wouldn't bet my life on his conscience, uh, but he's certainly performing a signal service to the cause of freedom of speech in the world today, which would be far more restricted than it is now because of his ownership of Twitter. I'm still suing him in the four courts of Dublin. I don't think I'm pulling out of that, Elon. Uh, Ian is in Ontario, in Canada, on the coup. Ian, go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, George, and I am a great admirer of all you do and have done. Uh, I just want to take a walk Thank down you. in some bit of nostalgia. Uh, I have to go back to 1940 at uh, Mers El Kabir when the French fleet was destroyed by the uh, British uh, Navy. And uh, there was one yes. submarine that escaped, escaped uh, that attack and f floated its way up to, uh, went its way up to uh, Dundee. And the commander of that was uh, Henri Rousselot, and he married a fine lady from Dundee, Margaret. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. As a, I don't know her maiden name, maiden name uh -huh. was, but... I, 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 this is fascinating. I don't know this story at all. Keep talking. Keep telling. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure your, 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 the people from your parents' generation would know her. Um, I know her uh, about her because her grandson was t teaching in Elisa in, in Brittany, where I was, and we didn't get along until we both found out that we had something in common. We both had a Scottish grandmother, mine from Carnoustie, and his from uh, from uh, uh, Dundee. Anyways, she married the wow. along with most of the, half of the half the crew married <coughs> Henri, and he became a vice admiral. And by the 1962, she was in Paris with him, and they invited over the Soviet delegation, along with the American delegation, and she sat at the end of the table with the, with the uh, Soviets. And they were so taken up with her, they said, oh, Margaret, what can we do for you? Also, next time, bring over uh, Yuri Gagarin. And so the next time she invited them over, uh, <clears throat> I said, well, we, we can get you to, you to come over, but we've got his medal. So she sold me one of her medals, and I thought, well, you know, this is... Because she she lived until about 2004. After that, she passed away, and so I got, didn't get to know about that. She did a lot for back in the you know 60 years ago for uh, you know against the Cold War, and uh, I, I was really impressed with her. And she was a great a great entertainer, a great. And she had the same accent in in French or in English as you do, uh, George. So <laughs> you can imagine. Wow. But she was very good looking. What woman. a great story. Just uh, tell me again, what was her maiden name? What was her married name? George. But I'm sure people, because when she passed away, or when her husband passed away back in the 90s, there were all sorts of articles in uh, the newspapers in Dundee about him passing away. Okay. Henri Rousselot. And the name of, okay. name of his um, submarine was uh, Ruby, which I guess you pronounce in English Ruby, but it was spelled R-U-B-I. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure there's, well, maybe not so many people left now in uh, Dundee, but people who... No, uh, my, my mother's still around. Uh, my mother's still around. And my sister lives in Karnusti. So uh, a, a very, very nice trip down memory lane from Ian in Ontario. Thank you for that, 
Ian. Uh, Andy Salo in the YouTube chat says, how about Sarkar being immortalized into the Moats legends month after month, year after year? He comes up with incredibly vital comments. Well, that's a, a good shout, Andy. I'll discuss it with my colleagues. Thanks uh, for making that suggestion. Quick break, and then it's Emmanuel in Philadelphia. Wait for that. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dichotomy of fact and fiction. As Fisher says, the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, I know a lot of you will be thinking that the proper answer to who will win the battle of the millionaires is it's a pity they both can't lose. But overwhelmingly, people fancy Elon Musk for the bout to the extent to which I begin to fear for the safety of Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, almost 15,000 people have voted on this poll and overwhelmingly 90, 80, 86, 86 People think that Musk is going to malium, as we say in Dundee. Emmanuel's on the line in Philadelphia on the Russian coup. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Hey, Mr. George Galloway, you are, I, I think uh, if it is possible, I will worship you but, because uh, it is uh, I'm a, a blasphemy Thank to, you. to Thank worship you. somebody. Don't. Look, Mr. Galloway, let me tell yeah, you something. Yeah. I, 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 I made a decision to change the name of my first son to George Galloway. <laughs> I want my son <laughs> to... <laughs> I'm telling you, the, I, 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 I propose to change my first son name. I want him to be known as George Galloway. I just decided to name him that name because of you, because of what you have done to the whole world. I've been following you. Well, I, I'm, I'm, it, I'm it, very it, touched, but I, I advise against it. It will it will dog you all your all your life. I'm just hoping my sons. I have three sons and three daughters. I'm hoping they all uh, follow in my footsteps. And let's all live our lives in a way that we'd be proud if our children followed in our footsteps. That's the way I uh, look at it. Now, what do you think happened in the Russian coup, yeah. Emmanuel? Yeah, George. I wanted to ask you because uh, I listened to President Putin and then. In his speech, there, there was something that Putin said. He uh, draw the uh, the lesson of the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. I think what he what, what he was saying mm. was that uh, such a thing has happened in the past in 1917 that uh, the Russians we are fighting, and then there was something that happened at the back. They were stabbed at the back. They were sabotaged at the back. I wanted to throw a light. What do you think President Putin meant by people, Russia? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't know what he meant. Uh, and uh, I must say before answering you, it was a hell of a speech for a man that's got brain cancer, liver cancer, stomach cancer, 
uh, kidney cancer, cancer of the bones, he's got oh, every kind of cancer, and had a stroke, and had a withered arm, and could scarcely walk, and may even be dead already. It was one hell of a speech by Vladimir Putin. He looked to be as healthy as any man with all those ailments could possibly look. He looked actually vibrant and strong and determined. And, uh, and I, I, I thought as I watched him, how, what the consternation must be amongst the liars and the propagandists that he plainly, quite self-evidently, is not a body double and that his body isn't bent and withered. And that as far as can be seen, his organs seem to be firing on all cylinders. I completely disagreed with what I assume he meant, which was that while the Russian army was at the front in the First World War, an imperialist war, which I believe should never have been fought, was fought between three grandsons of Queen Victoria and was all about empire and lands and foreign conquest and so on. That the uprising first in February, not led by the Bolsheviks, and in October of the same year, 1917, led by the Bolsheviks and successful, and bringing about the overthrow of uh, the monarchy in Russia, pulling Russia out of the war, uh, I think that he was comparing what Prigozhin had done to that. Uh, but it wasn't a proper comparison for a significant number of reasons. First of all, in scale, uh, this was a maverick, adventurist day outing by, uh, by a mercenary company leader, uh, your former chef, uh, and, uh, and a man with a very checkered criminal record as a, as a thief. Uh, so uh, the comparison between Prigozhin and Lenin is not a comparison that should be made. And secondly, the mishandling of the war, the self-evident pointlessness of the First World War, the scale of the slaughter of Russian soldiery in the First World War, and the economic starvation and immiseration that was being experienced by the vast mass of Russian workers, peasants, soldiers, and sailors made the revolution absolutely inevitable. And from my point of view, one of the greatest events in the history of the world. So me and Putin are not exactly like that on that subject. If that's what he meant, of course, I have no idea if he did. Eric in Washington, D.C. on Prigozhin. Go ahead, Eric. Hello. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you the name uh, Sir George Galloway in uh, the hopes that... I'll take um, that. Thank you very much. I'll yes, take that. Thank the, you, Eric. Uh, the, um, the, the career that, that you have had and that... Uh, your facing of justice can only be comparable to, I believe, your good friend, Sir Alex Ferguson. Thank you so much. Well, we have a lot in common, except I never Absolutely. played for Rangers. Although my sons, <laughs> my sons might, if the money's right. <laughs> you know, we have, uh, we have uh, your, your son, Rooney, here in Washington, D.C. He's our, he's our head coach. DC United. Uh, I know he is. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, an under, he's an underrated superstar. And he was doing really well as a manager at Derby County also. So I'm glad he's back with you now. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Um, so I guess I you would love to hear your favorite, favorite game at, uh, at, at Old Trafford. But I, I can push forward to, uh, to uh, I guess, my thoughts Prigozhin. on... Uh, Go on to Prigozhin, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, I, I got this idea, and I don't really kind of know where it is. Obviously, this kind of all jumped on us. But I have, like, this feeling that maybe what Rut, they're trying to do is distance Wagner from the Russian state. And maybe that will be more valuable to it being a global peacekeeper as opposed to an arm of the the the, the state. That's the only thing I could think of. Yeah, it's not a bad show. Uh, he, he's already uh, taken the company into Africa. Uh, if I was facing, for example, some of these ISIS, Al-Qaeda type uh, terrorist operations, and I was the president of an African country, I'd definitely hire Wagner. Uh, I think uh, they'd be the best way to rid my country of this scourge of Islamist uh, terrorism. Uh, and it might be that he is put to work in Africa. Maybe Minsk is, is only uh, a temporary call. Uh, we'll need to wait and see. As I put it, I thought rather pithily, uh, if he turns out to be a man looking for a balcony to fall off, if he ends up sleeping on a park bench, uh, then he clearly will not have been engaged in a conspiracy over the last couple of days. If, on the other hand, he thrives and uh, lives on safely, uh, then maybe that will encourage people to think that way. Uh, Putin is a very, very clever man, and he, uh, he has a habit of seeking to tease out uh, undercurrents in the oligarchy, in the elite, uh, in the uh, upper reaches, if you like, of, of Russian society. He has a history of that. This would be, you know, off the park levels of it, but you couldn't entirely rule it out, Eric. Anyway, thanks for the call and the kind words. Martin in Bristol uh, is up next on the coup. Go ahead, Martin. Martin, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? I can now, yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, I had an invasion from Moscow within an hour of the coup. At the moment, um, people forget Gozin is one of Putin's best friends. He was known as a caterer and did the catering for Putin for about five years. Um, yeah. So far, eight, over 1,800 dissidents have been arrested that came out in support of the coup. And um, so I, I personally believe that it was a complete planned psyop, and it was very, very a masterstroke to me. He's gone to Belarus, supposedly in disgrace. He's now organising the army in Belarus. Um, the idea of him um, being blackmailed or, or paid lots of money to do this, he's already a multi-multi-millionaire because of um, the... I think he's, he's probably a billionaire, actually. Yeah. yeah, I think exactly. he's probably a billionaire, yeah. I don't believe you could buy him. And um, I think it's the masterstroke because purely um, it's uncovered all the people against Putin. Um, you got to remember, he only had a thousand men with him. They didn't do anything violent on the way to Moscow. Um, Putin's got an 80% support rating by the Russian people. So um, the idea of him being successful or anything like that is, is just insane. Um, so, personally, he's supposedly been sent to Belarus in disgrace. I believe he's actually now in control and, and planning with the Belarusian army, um, which makes sense. Um, well, look, I, I, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I, I don't rule it out. I don't reject it out of hand. As I say, I'm, I'm not yet, at least, in that place that you are. Uh, I also have a problem thinking that Lukashenko would allow Prigozhin to reorganize his army. First of all, his army is rather good, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, his alliance with Russia is now closer than ever before. Indeed, it seems silly to me uh, that they are not one country. They are, of course, linked through various uh, treaties and military and economic and former Soviet territory treaties and so on. But... I would have thought that uh, part of the development 
of a reunifying of the Russian world that I talked about earlier would include a merger uh, between uh, Belarus and, and uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, and I hope that happens uh, because I think it will be good for everybody uh, concerned. But Lukashenko is uh, very friendly uh, with Prigozhin and that's why having taken permission from Putin he was able to be the intermediary, at least if this official story is the real story. Uh, one question to you though, uh, Martin, before I have to wind up. Uh, did you see any footage or pictures that were unequivocally pictures, footage of Prigozhin killing Russians on the way up the, the M4? No. Absolutely not. And I saw the Russian people coming out. It was like a carnival. It wasn't like they, um, Pagosian was here violent. He only had a thousand men with him. The rest were left on the front lines. Um, but Chechen took over anything that, um, that Pagosian, um, took with him. The Chechen took over from him. Yeah. Um, Belarus yeah. has, has, you know, 30, 40,000 people. Russian soldiers in Belarus at the moment. Um, and I don't believe yeah. Russia would want Belarus to organize them. Um, well, just one more thing. I don't know if you knew about this, George. Um, Matt Gates, which is a congressman in America, um, two days ago he called a vote giving Biden executive powers to bomb Chinese infrastructure in Cuba, which is insane. I mean, it's totally insane. Um, yeah, yeah, it won't happen, uh, but he does, uh, he does have the power. Uh, isn't it funny that China cannot have infrastructure in Cuba, but the United States can have infrastructure all around China and can have military bases with nuclear weapons pointing at China all around China. Does nobody with any kind of influence in the United States, not stop and think, wait a minute, if we have all this hardware around China, why can't China have one listening post in Cuba? Does nobody ever think that this is a level of exceptionalism too far? Does nobody ever think that, wait a minute, who gave us the right to have more than 800 military bases in countries all over the world and surrounding the countries with which we are in greatest antipathy, but they're not allowed to have even one in our hemisphere? I think that the development of multipolar power in the world should mean and will mean that there will be Russian bases in Venezuela, there will be Chinese bases in Cuba, and maybe Russian bases in Cuba, as there were once upon a time, and Chinese bases in Venezuela. The uh, people of Mexico, uh, right next door to the United States, have elected a president who is striking an independent course and wants to be part of uh, a pan-Latin American development leading into the BRICS uh, under the leadership of AMLO in the north and Lula in the south. Uh, how long before the U.S. tries regime changing the president of Mexico? And if they do try and fail, why wouldn't Mexico ask for support from Russia and China? I would, wouldn't you? If I was the president of Mexico, I'd be surrounded right now by Russian bodyguards. Maybe Chinese bodyguards also. Makes sense, doesn't it? Well, look, considering we only had one guest, this show has been a good one and uh, has passed very quickly indeed. And I've now overshot my time. So the results of the poll, 15,000 people voted, almost everybody certainly 8 out of 10, uh, nearer to 9 out of 10, believe that Elon Musk will win the battle of the billionaires. It's been marvellous 
for me. Uh, I hope it was for you. And if it was, please come back at the later hour of 9 p.m. UK time on Wednesday for the midweek mother of all talk shows. And please do look back at the Moats of Deutsch from earlier today. It was, I think, the best of our German shows. Till then, good night.